Good evening, everybody. It's a great privilege and honor to be able to address you this evening and give you the report that Robin just mentioned. Um, those of you here in Lancaster Gate, our UPF headquarters, but also all of those of you watching from wherever you are around the country and further afield. Um, yes, it was also a great privilege to go to Korea this time. It's always a privilege to go there for these big occasions because um, an extraordinary mixture of people come there from all over the world, very high level people on the whole for these summits. And um, uh, each time there is a, a very distinct feeling that UPF is growing, that it's traction with the world's elites, if you like, with leaders of the world, with uh, all kinds of distinguished professionals in different fields, is, is growing and growing. And uh, <clears throat> this time was no exception. So I want to share with you uh, just a little bit about what happened? This is the, um, the schedule for the conference. As you can see, it started on the 11th of August, ended on the 14th. And the opening day was uh, orientation and uh, some uh, introductory session. And the second day, opening plenary, International Youth Leaders Conference, um, a special session on religious freedom in the afternoon, and a performance by the Little Angels in the evening. And then on the Saturday, the 13th, a series of academic conferences of different areas of UPF activity, which I'll mention as I go through. And then finally, on the 14th, on the Sunday, there was a, what they, in Korea they call a Songhwa festival celebration uh, for the 10th anniversary of the ascension of Father Moon as the co-founder of, of UPF. So that was basically the event those four days, but I want to go into uh, some of the substance of the various um, sessions, but also try and point out some of the highlights which indicate what I was just saying just now, that there's a palpable growth process going on from major event to major event, and this time was, was no exception. First of all, I'll just share with you some of the speakers in the first session. Uh, who happen to be from, from our region, from Europe and the Middle East. The one on the left is a very important uh, breakthrough for us, which I'll share more about later. His name is Boris Tadic, and he was president of Serbia from 2004 to 2012. And he's somebody, as you'll see, who very much feels that his whole life has been a preparation for working with UPF, and he says as much in some of his reflections. Then from the Middle East, we had Nazi Alabidi, who is Minister of Youth for uh, Tunisia and also Family Affairs, Women and Family Affairs for three years until 2019. And um, that's very relevant because you'll see later on that youth and developing youth work in Africa was one of the highlights, one of the key purposes of this summit. And then on the right there, you have Grigory Novak, who's a member of parliament from Moldova. Um, then we had the opening ceremony and the beginning of the, um, of the 12th. Uh, you have there on the left Mike Pompeo, former Secretary of State and CIA uh, Director. In the middle, Brigi Rafini, former Prime Minister of Niger, not Nigeria, Niger. And um, also now the Executive Secretary of an organization called SENSAD. Not many people have heard this, but actually it's a very important organization in Africa. And it's the largest intergovernmental organization apart from the African Union, in that which of course involves all the African states uh, in Africa. And then on the right hand side, this is representing the very close relationship that has developed between the state of Cambodia uh, in Northeast Asia and UPF. And they have actually gone to the extent of, uh, the Prime Minister Hun Sen has gone to the extent of uh, creating something called the Asian Vision Institute. And the whole purpose of this Asian Vision Institute is to use all the expertise at the disposal of Cambodia, the top academics, the parliamentarians, the, whoever has something to say about uh, bringing uni unity in Northeast Asia, particularly on the Korean Peninsula. Yes, uh, he came as the representative of uh, Hun Sen himself, the Prime Minister, who would have come if he hadn't been involved in being president of ASEAN, the uh, 
interstate uh, organization of Northeast Asia. So um, those were three of the people at the opening ceremony. Then we also had videos from various people. Um, we're showing you here just the European, well, not just the European ones. There was Donald Trump, no needs no introduction. And Jose Manuel Barroso, who lives here in London and is working very closely with us now, most notably because he's taken the position of chair of the Sunak Peace Prize, which is the sort of Nobel-type prize that, that uh, UPF has initiated in the last few years. But in addition to these two, we had Yves Le Terme from Europe, former Prime Minister of Belgium, who's just taken the position of, uh, of a director of the advisory board on the advisory board of uh, the International Summit Council in Europe, which is our organization. And also um, Ehud Olmert, who's a former Prime Minister of Israel. So we have, were well represented from Europe at the opening ceremony. Now I want to just mention here a bit more about the purpose of the summit itself. There were two main purposes that we were seeking to achieve. One was to really help with the development of Africa. And the other one was to help with the development of reunification processes on the Korean Peninsula. And why is Africa important? Well, from a UPF perspective, there are many, many reasons why Africa is very important. First of all, Africa is a, a continent where 70%, no less than 70% of the population are under 20 years of age. It's a remarkable phenomenon. So it's an incredible opportunity to educate the future population of Africa if we can win the youth of, of uh, Africa for the principles of, of UPF. Fortunately, we are not only working there on our own uh, to do this, we have the cooperation of, uh, this is Prime Minister on the right, Brig, Brig, Brig Rafini, former Prime Minister of Niger, and who's now uh, Secretary General of CENSAT, the organization that I was talking about, which is basically the middle of Africa upwards. It involves uh, the, the um, Mediterranean countries along the Mediterranean coast, Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt, those countries but also countries down to as far as Central Africa. 25 countries, and as I said, the most, in, most uh, numerous number of nations in Africa of any organization except the African Union itself. And they are very interested in educating and training young people for the same reasons as us. And Brig Ruffini is a great devotee of UPF, I think it's fair to say. He believes very much in the principles of UPF. He's been working with UPF for three or four years now. And um, this was a signing ceremony. On the left is Dr. Yoon Young Ho, who's our uh, global uh, secretary general for UPF, and uh, some other African ministers of education and youth and so on in the background. And um, so we've established this MOU by which we will be taking a great interest and investing seriously in youth education. Why is youth education important in Africa more than anywhere else? It's because the, the opportunities for education are so much less than, say, in Western Europe. And um, also, youth is exposed to things like um, uh, terrorism in Nigeria. One of the big problems, Boko Haram, they are grabbing the youth and bringing them into the, their terrorist networks, and this is a similar phenomena are common throughout that whole region of Africa. And of course, young people don't have uh, great advantages of primary or secondary education, and uh, therefore they very easily fall prey to immorality of various promiscuity or drug abuse or any of these other things that can affect young people. So this MOU is a commitment on the part of UPF to really invest in the education of youth in Africa. And in fact, some of you may know that UPF in the UK already has a project uh, with Nigeria particularly to educate Nigerian youth. So we're doing it on many levels, but uh, this is fundamental to the growth of and the development of Africa in the future, to have a young generation coming up who are um, educated in the right way. Sorry. Now, the other, th the other great group of people who came from Africa was this group of 47 religious leaders. And the great majority of these 47 were not religious leaders that we've had before. 
Uh, in fact, the ones there mostly are Sheikh Mansour, Prophet Radebi, and Archbishop Ndanga. But the rest of them, the other 44 or whatever it was, they are uh, religious leaders who've come for the first time to any unification or UPF event in Africa or elsewhere. So we had to get to know them, but it was actually a great delight to do so because we found they were so open to the ideals that UPF espouses. So on the right, you have the, the new one of these four, Father Bazila Mbila. He was just uh, spoken to a few days before the conference. He didn't know us at all, but we were, vi we were working closely with the African Union. And while on a visit there, one of our key leaders in Africa, Kathy Rigney, uh, was able to talk to him and discovered he was actually the Catholic chaplain to the African Union. Invited him, he came is profoundly moved and uh, very much wants to work with us in the future. Um, another facet of this whole uh, summit was a fact-finding delegation from the United States, mostly, almost exclusively, um, visiting top leaders in Korea, top government ministers, the Minister of Defense, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, various other key people in the South Korean government to talk about prospects for Korean reunification, which was the other purpose of the, of the summit. And these two people are very key people from the past. One is Walter Sharp there was commander of the UN command, all the Republic of Korean and US forces in the, in the whole region on the whole peninsula for three years from 2008 to 2011. And Ambassador Harry Harris was the um, admiral of the I forget which fleet America has in that region, but anyway, the American fleet in that region. And he was, after that, from 2018, was the ambassador of the United States to Korea. So both key people in linking uh, America and uh, uh, the Korean Peninsula. Another person was, this was at the time of the um, visit, or leading up to the visit of uh, the speaker of the US Congress, um, Nancy Pelosi, and uh, Annette Liu was invited as representative of Taiwan. The delegation was led by Joe Detrani, who was uh, formerly on the, the American representative on the six party talks that involves uh, China, uh, Russia, and North Korea on the one hand, and South Korea, Japan, and the USA on the other. And he's a very famous person, very influential person. He's still very much involved in American uh, uh, government affairs, but uh, he's also very closely connected to UPF, believes very much in the principles of UPF. And so he was leading this delegation, and uh, the way that they were received was beyond all expectations from what I've heard of the reports. I wasn't involved in that side of things myself, but uh, there was nobody who wouldn't meet them they also had some American congressmen, which was important. And um, their um, visit was uh, really outstandingly successful in building bridges with the South Korean regime, which was part of the purpose. Then other uh, delegates to the, uh, on the visit were Charlie Hurt, who's the opinion editor at the Washington Times, which is the uh, sister organization of UPF in the United States, and Chris Dolan, who's the president and executive editor of the paper. So a lot of reporting went back, as you can imagine, to the American uh, capital through the Washington Times. Then there was a session on religious freedom, and one of the key uh, speakers there was Mike Pompeo, who I'm sure most of you have come across. He was CIA director from, I think, 2016 to 2017, and also Secretary of State under Donald Trump for almost four years. And um, anyway, the importance of Mike Pompeo is much more than the fact that he participated and supported the, in and supported the religious freedom uh, session uh, because he is somebody who's come to understand very deeply, more deeply than most people I know, the importance of the principles that UPF is trying to see established as part of the global uh, community. And he wears his heart on his sleeve as a Christian um, I don't know which denomination, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, he says, I never made a secret of the fact that being a strong believer of Christ followed me for all the challenges I faced. 
ruffled some feathers in Washington. As Secretary of State, I kept an Opal Bible, an open Bible on my desk, read it daily. It wasn't for show. As a leader, it's vital to stay grounded in the truth. This commitment led me to truth, led me to believe that defending religious freedom should be a central focus of American foreign policy. And as you'll see, because I want to show you his actual presentation uh, to the uh, event on the 14th, celebrating the anniversary of Father Moon's uh, ascension, uh, he is someone who very deeply understands the work of UPF on the Korean Peninsula. So uh, I'll save explanation for later, but basically he went so far as to put his own involvement, which was meeting with Kim Jong-un, uh, preparing the way for Donald Trump's three, three meetings with Kim Jong-un in Singapore, in uh, Phnom Penh, and where was the other one, Saigon? I forget where. Um, and um, he compared his own contributions being tiny, minuscule, compared to the contribution that Father and Mother Moon made in initiating their peace process on the Korean Peninsula. We're going to see that uh, testimony of his a little later on. Then others on the uh, session on religious freedom were the director of our sister organization, Japan on Legal Affairs, of Legal Affairs. And on the right was one of the victims of religious kidnapping, uh, one of our members in Japan who was kidnapped and held for 12 and a half years to try and break his faith in the unification uh, doctrines and failed. And he then went on to get the law changed effectively in Japan about religious freedom. So this sort of thing would be much more difficult in future. And um, it was relevant because uh, we currently have something of a problem in Japan. Some of you may have read about it. The Guardian had a piece a while ago. The Times had a big piece about a month ago. Um, and basically, our movement in Japan, UPF, but also Family Federation, Women's Federation, and others, are being, uh, they're trying to uh, basically prevent them from being active, to put it in a kind way. And uh, this is all to do with Japanese politics. It's also to do with the fact that for as long as we've been involved in Japan, um, we have tried to explain the fallacies of communism, of, of materialistic, godless communism. And um, in that regard, um, we've come to have enemies in the Japanese communist movement and in the Chinese communist party and so on. So um, there are many things involved in the activities against us. But religious freedom seems to be the key to preventing those things from destroying our movement in Japan. So I'll explain a little bit more about that later on. But um, two other people were very key, and they are both Europeans. And this is sort of to explain how much Europe can actually contribute to protecting the situation in Japan. Uh, Massimo Intravenia is probably one of the handful of the most uh, renowned and capable sociologists of religion in the world. He's also a practicing lawyer in Italy. And he also has the largest single library of anywhere in the world of any university or of any individual in his own home dealing with uh, new religions. He is really the global expert on, on new religious movements. And the problem of religious freedom is most often found in relation to new religious movements. So his uh, contribution was very key to that session on religious freedom. The other person who was key, some of you may have been here a, a week or two ago, when, how, I forget how long ago it was, 4th of August, uh, three, three weeks ago or more, um, when Jan Fiegel was speaking here on this very platform. Jan Fiegel is one of the most renowned experts and uh, people have made a difference in terms of religious freedom around the world. He was the EU's special envoy for religious freedom outside of the EU from 2016 to 2019. And he's most famous, I'm sure most of you have heard of him in relation to the famous case of Asher Bibi. You've probably heard, you remember that one. It was a problem in Pakistan. This young Christian woman had been sentenced to death and imprisoned for seven years. And um, he basically was the one who engineered her uh, being able to get out of Pakistan and migrate to Canada and, and to safety. And so he is um, a very much renowned figure in this field around the world. And both of these gentlemen are helping us very much in Japan to explain to the Japanese government and 
whoever will listen, that religious freedom dictates that we, as well as everyone else, should be able to have access to politicians. Religion shouldn't be barred from having any communication with politicians just because they're religious. And um, so then this led to the signing of a declaration on the universal value of religious freedom. In the picture there, you see those two gentlemen, but also others like Newt Gingrich and uh, others from the United States who were at the conference. Then there was a performance of the Little Angels. Uh, always we like to have a, a strong cultural element in our, in our um, uh, events. And um, that went down very well. And then we had a symposium of various academic contributions about peaceful reunification of the Korean Peninsula. Um, why this is important is because a, a lot of people think that Korean reunification is just about politics, just about politicians meeting each other, negotiating with each other, reconciling <coughs> excuse me, with each other. But um, what UPF understands is that it's going to take a multi-dimensional approach, um, multidisciplinary approach from diplomacy, from politics, from economics, from uh, the academic sciences, from uh, all kinds of different disciplines to come up with a solution that is workable on the Korean Peninsula, to find harmony and unity enough between North and South that they can agree uh, maybe gradually over a period of time to merge as, uh, and become one nation again. So uh, these people are all key people. Dr. Mansurov is one of the world's leading experts on Korea, originally Russian, then went to um, North Korea for, he was in North Korea for many years actually, and then went to the United States and is now a professor at Georgetown University. Dr. Kim Long is from this same institute that I mentioned, uh, founded by uh, Cambodia to help with reunification, together with UPF. Dr. Petrescu is uh, a leading expert from the Russian Academy of Sciences, which is the most prestigious academic body in Russia, on Korean reunification, but also on uh, all issues to do with uh, China and Northeast Asia. Dr. Cormont, Barthélemy Cormont, is a um, leading expert in a think tank in France. Thank you very much. Very needed. Thank you. And um, Dr. Cormont has worked with us also on this reunification process. Then Dr. William Lay is a, a legal, legal academic in the United States as well. So uh, then uh, Vladimir Petrovsky uh, again, and then from Albania, former deputy education minister and coordinator of International, uh, International Association of Academics for Peace, um, Samira Pino, and Martin Ramirez from Spain, who's also an expert on um, reunification on the Korean Peninsula. Three commentators, again, Dr. Cormor, we just saw, Sunida Messi, former Deputy Prime Minister of Albania, we've met in the last year or so, and Nuno Andre, who's a leading young theologian in the Catholic Church. And then, um, one of the highlights that I already mentioned was this focus on Africa. We had not only ministers of youth from the Sensad, the uh, northerly uh, nations of Africa, but also uh, Minister of Education from Niger, the Minister of Civic Education from Malawi, which of course is in the south of Africa. And um, then there was a um, very touching ceremony where the uh, University of Peace in Costa Rica, which is run by the United Nations, founded by the United Nations, and uh, regulated by the United Nations, uh, awarded both Father and Mother Moon, the co-founders of UPF, a very special honor of, a, of an honorary doctorate, which is very special for the reason that no person that we know of or they know of has ever been awarded it posthumously. So, of course, Father Moon passed away 10 years ago and he's only now getting his honorary doctorate, but I'm sure he's very happy about it. So, so that was a very, that was Mother Moon receiving her honorary doctorate and then a, a, a giving of gifts from the Middle East, from Lebanon to Mother Moon um, as part of the celebration on the 14th of uh, Father Moon's ascension. But what I wanted to focus on 
uh, most of all, because I think it illustrates the point that I made at the beginning very clearly, is this sense of the development of UPF. Because Mike Pompeo has not been involved with UPF for very long. He's not been out of government for the very long, for that matter. And, um, and yet, he's somebody who's discovered UPF quite recently in the last year or two. And he's come to understand it very deeply. Not least, as I mentioned, he's come to understand uh, the importance of UPF's initiative on the Korean Peninsula to unite North and South. And he was, of course, as I mentioned before, he, he was involved in the setting up the meetings between Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un. Uh, but as, of course, as Secretary of State, he handled the relationship between the um, United States and North Korea, the United States of South Korea, the United States and Japan, um, as well as, of course, China and Russia during that period, the, the other five parties to the six-party talks. And um, what is amazing is that he really understands that he's willing to declare very publicly, as you'll see in a moment, that what he did was a little bit of a sideshow. He doesn't use a, that exact word, but the visits of Donald Trump to those various capitals in Northeast Asia and the efforts of various um, American presidents over the years have been relatively minor compared to the peace initiative initiated by Father and Mother Moon when they went to North Korea in 1991, in December 1991. So, uh, Raymond, are you ready to show the video? I'd just like to let you listen to Mike point at Pompeo and then I'll give you a few comments to that afterwards as well. So. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for that most gracious welcome. Uh, distinguished world leaders, ladies and gentlemen, it is a true privilege to be with you here today. It's an honor to be part of this memorial program in honor of the life of Reverend Sung Young Moon and Dr. Hak Jan, ha, Jok, Jok Han Moon. Having had the chance to visit North Korea, to be there, and having met so many who lost their families and loved ones due to the Korean War and the 72 years of separation that follows, I know the unspeakable pain in the Korean people's hearts for those who lost their loved ones. I know the pain has been deep in the heart of Dr. Sun Myung Moon and his wife, Dr. Hak Jahan Moon. Yet through that pain, hard work, they worked to reunite North and South Korea. This is a story of love and passion and a deep understanding about what makes people great. Reverend Moon, as you know, was born in North Korea. He grew up under Japan's occupation until America brought it to an end. After the Soviet-backed communists, led by Kim Il-sung, took over North Korea, Reverend Moon was arrested, imprisoned, and tortured, along with many others, including many other Christian pastors. He was sent to Hungnam, a North Korean communist death camp. During this time, Reverend Moon learned the critical flaws of communist ideology, the most fundamental of which is that denies the existence of our God and the value of every human life. Two things happened in that prison camp. First, first Reverend Moon survived because of his faith in a loving God. Second, he determined he would vote his entire life to helping the world free itself and overcome communism. He saw, Reverend Moon saw, Reverend Moon saw clearly, he saw clearly why communism would always seek to destroy religion. It had to because faithful obedience to God leaves no room for submission to a totalitarian regime. He also knew that it's only God's love that can satisfy the human soul. And no man or government can make itself ruler over men and women who have been born free. War came here, it came to the peninsula. Thanks to General MacArthur and his soldiers and their landing at Inchon, the UN coalition troops, many of which were American, a man, many of them like my father who served in the Navy during that war, they bombed Hung Nam and the prisoners escaped from their hell. Reverend Moon did not flee though. He went back to Pyongyang to gather church members who would go with him to the south. 
even when he, even when he had finally found freedom, Reverend Moon continued to work every day to save others. He gathered those who could journey with him and they headed south. He walked to the border and he crossed it. In Seoul, he came back to found the Holy Spirit Association for the Unification of World Christianity. He called for the unity of all Christians and for each of us to love each other. He taught that Christianity through strong families and faith in the Lord must not oppose God denying, or must constantly oppose God denying communism. He then was blessed. The Lord blessed him. He married Dr. Hak Jam Han Moon in 1960, and the church continued to grow. Due to his experience with communism, he knew that Japan and Korea were critical to join America to stop the expansion of communism in Asia and indeed all around the world. This remains true today. He began by starting what became Victory Over Communism, activities to educate Japanese and Korean students that communism as an ideology was empty and barren of hope and of love. He offered a different view, one which affirms that God is the origin of all life, and he challenged the fallacies of communist ideologies everywhere. He worked tirelessly to stop communism. Reverend Moon also understood the importance of America and its place in fighting communism. He'd seen it when he was freed from that prison camp in the North, that America must be strong and it must be moral and it must be free and have a free press. He knew that America must be supported by those timeless pillars of freedom, of faith, and of family. I couldn't agree more. He, in 1982, Reverend Moon and Dr. Hak Jah Han Moon started the Washington Times. This year, it will celebrate its 40th anniversary. That puts it at the same year I began my journey as a young cadet. That 40 years is a testament to the work and vision of Reverend Moon and Dr. Moon. This, this lovely story, this remarkable history, is where I would like to close today. This last remarkable story of Reverend Moon's life, North Korean dictator Kim Il-sung had sent assassins to kill Reverend and Dr. Moon in both South Korea and when they traveled to America. Undeterred by this danger, Reverend and Dr. Moon resolved that they would love their enemy no matter the potential personal cost to each of them. This was as they knew as Christ had commanded his faithful to do many years ago on the shores of Galilee. In this spirit, they went to the north to meet with Kim Il-sung in 1991. They went with sincerity in their hearts, with a deep desire to help North Korea move towards freedom and to democracy. Many would have balked at such a mission. Many would have thought it too risky, thinking that two people should not take that risk because the likelihood of them changing decades of division and tyranny was simply too great. But Reverend and Dr. Moon didn't go there as two people. No, they went there instead as humble servants of the Lord, called to spread his word in his name and in that place. In his preparation, in his preparation meeting with Chairman Kim's close advisors, Reverend Moon boldly proclaimed that Kim's Juche ideology wouldn't work for it denied the existence of a living God who we all know and love. Many expected that the meeting would be canceled because they'd said that, because of their declarations of faith and even feared that Reverend Dr. Moon's delegation might well be arrested for having uttered their commitment to the Lord. Instead, instead a miracle occurred. Jeremy Kim welcomed them to the dinner and they talked like distant relatives brought together after a long separation. Reverend and Dr. Moon broke bread with their persecutor, with their potential prosecutor, just as Christ 
had broken bread with sinners. This meeting, this meeting, this meeting marked the beginning of a long peace process, of which I was privileged to be a small part during my time as America's Secretary of State. I'm thrilled to be here today. I am thrilled to be here today. I am humbled and thrilled to be here today because I know that one day we will see the Korean people united in freedom. Following Dr. Reverend, following Reverend Moon's, following Reverend Moon's passing, Dr. Hak Jahan Moon has continued this noble, great work that she and her husband had spent their lives engaged in. She embraces leaders who are with us today from all across the world, from the Middle East and from Asia, from Africa and Europe, and from the Americas as well, and from China and Russia, and from North Korea. We've seen over these last few days leaders, leaders from everywhere, joining her in her efforts to bring North and South Korea together peacefully. She has done magnificent work in expanding what she and her husband started Bless you, madam. On this, on this Memorial Day, my wife Susan and I, we want to thank Reverend Sung Young Moon and Dr. Hak Jahan Moon for their work towards peace. And we pray for Dr. Moon's success in bringing North and South Korean together it is the Lord's work. God bless all of you, and may we one day gather in peace together. Thank you. So <clears throat> I hope you could get some feeling from that about the, the momentous quality of what Mike Pompeo was saying. Bear in mind that you know he's a past politician, but I think he's a man with a future. Who knows, he could be president of the United States. He could be, again, be, um, Secretary of State. There are many possibilities. If not next time, then the time afterwards. He's still only 57, 58 years of age. So he's somebody who carries now the principles of UPF, the heart of Father and Mother Moon, very much in his own heart. And to me, the remarkable thing is a lot of politicians, if they felt like that, would keep very quiet about it because it's a bit controversial and some people may criticize him. But he's so absolutely upfront and he wears his heart on his sleeve about this. And this is what I mean by uh, the principles of UPF engaging on a higher level now, more than ever before. In the past, I, before this summit, I felt we had participants at summits, and these people were participating in a summit. But now I feel like they're really engaging with UPF, engaging with the principles and the practices of UPF in a, in a whole new way. Mike Pompeo is just one example of that, that I could cite from the whole, whole event. So I think it, it bodes very well for the future. But there were others as well, so he's not the only one, uh, because I think from a European perspective, the most important person, this is my final point, by the way, Margaret, because Margaret's worried I'm going on too long. Um, the the uh, importance of Boris Tadic is that he was, as I mentioned before, president of Serbia for eight years, from 2004 to 2012. But also he's a very unusual Serbian president because he espouses very profound principles, mainly based, I have to say, on psychology, although partly on faith as well, about the need to take international relations to a new level. And what, what he means by that is that it's about engaging heart to heart between people. It's not about trading off, uh, I'll stop using those arms if you stop trading those arms with somebody else or whatever. It's not about that, it's about, it's about really engaging heart to heart between people and really engaging with not only my, my, the needs of my nation, but the needs of the other nation in a very profound way. Being genuinely concerned about the welfare of the other and not just about oneself and, well, whatever happens to the other person doesn't matter so much. So I think um, Boris Tadic is, is a, a very exceptional politician in anywhere, but especially in, in um, Serbia. 
because not too many politicians have had his same kind of uh, heart as an approach to peace. So he basically said, and I, I, I was going to read you the whole of his testimony because he wrote a page and a half testimony on, on uh, uh, letterhead of a former president of Serbia, but uh, that would take too long. But basically what he's saying is he feels that his whole life uh, and I, he told me this when, I, he, when, I, when he first arrived at the, at the event. I sat down with him for 20 minutes or half an hour and talked, and he was so excited, like a, almost like a, a child, almost, in a, in a good way. And um, he really felt that he was coming to something special. And what, in his testament at the end, what he testifies to is essentially that he has found something that he's been looking for all of his life a project that can help world peace to be established on a whole new level. And the whole new level is not to do with arms or to do with money or economics or whatever, but to do with the human heart. And he's a professor of psychology and you know, he, he's taught these kind of principles himself. So he was very, when he says he's grateful to Mother Moon uh, and Father Moon as well, of course, for their commitment, because such commitment is exactly what is needed at the global level as a driver of building a new system of values, a new kind of engaged work for peace building, that is what he feels he's found in UPF. And he's pledged to work with us closely. He wants to work with us on starting a, a center for peace in the Balkans. We didn't have time to tell him we already have one. We want to invite him there. But anyway, he is uh, an extremely important person for the future because we see the Balkans, Father and Mother Moon saw the Balkans as the key part of Europe because uh, okay, the rest of the Europe, there's the EU, and most Balkan nations want to be part of the EU, but actually the EU isn't living up to these principles. So the idea is to start a Balkan union of some kind between the various nations, which the uh, principles of UPF are very much front and foremost, and uh, Boris Tadic wants to work with us in that. So there again, you have another example of people not just participating, but people coming to engage committing themselves and wanting to work with us in the future and people of this very, very highest level in that part of Europe. So I think from that point of view, it was a very um, successful event and I'm sure it's going to raise the next summit up to a whole new level still. We'll see even greater things there. So uh, please keep watching this space. Thank you.